Welcome to lecture three on scheduling. We will be going through group scheduling now. Okay, so an important concept that we will introduce today that we will actually apply to more than scheduling is Linux control groups. So Linux control groups provide fine-grained control over resource usage and accounting for a grouping of processes. So when we want to discuss how do you group processes together and put a common constraint on all of them, that's where Linux control groups come in. Now, what is a resource? So there can be many, but the ones that are important are like CPU, memory, network, file IO, and uh, control groups have been built for all of these and, and some more. So a resource control is a control group you know, that is configured such that you can control resource consumption. But the only thing we do not do is resource control. We also do resource accounting through control groups. Now Linux provides uh, the ability to account for fine grained usage of resources. And sometimes you may want to just do accounting at other times control groups will do what their name suggests is actually to control. Usually it's both you are controlling and you're accounting for the usage of the controlled entity. How are control groups enabled? Well, control groups use the file system. The file system is the way most of Linux management happens. So control groups actually use a C group FS file system that gets mounted at slash sys slash FS slash C group. And that is where the files get loaded and that need to be managed. So how will this file system look like and how are we going to actually change something here? So let's look at the directory structure view of slash sys slash fs slash c group mount where we have mounted the c group fs file system. So under this directory, you will see the, the c group controls enabled and assuming that you actually have enabled them. And there are a few models to enable these. They could be combined or you can keep these separated. And uh, I'm going by the default view that I see and probably is the prevalent view. Mm -hmm. uh, you have slash memory where the memory directory is and controls are structured slash block IO where the IO controls are structured slash CPU set for the uh, multiple CPU structuring, CPU affinity of a process slash CPU comma slash CPU account. Now this is a combined CPU accounting control group and CPU control group that are combined in the same directory structure. So they they don't separate. And, and that's probably because most of the time you want to have these two working together. And then there are others too. So what are the core things about this? Well, you are attached to the C group uh, file system. Now, you control processes under these groups. So somehow the goal is that you actually put processes here and you tell the system, okay, these processes are part of this control group. The way that happens is through the slash, the cgroup.prox file and the, the tasks file. So you can put a process ID, the PID in the cgroup.prox file. You could also put the PID in the tasks file. And the difference between cgroup.prox versus tasks is that uh, tasks is inclusive of all of the threads as well. So typically you will just push a process to cgroup.prox file and uh, that will put it as part of that cgroup. Now cgroups have a hierarchical structure. So if you want to create a group, you have to define a grouping of processes together. So under each of these top level directories, uh, like slash memory slash CPU, we actually have the ability to create further subdirectories. And in the example I show on this hierarchy chart is I created slash group one and slash group two under CPU, CPU accounting. Now I can put my processes that I want to be part of group one in the file in slash group one and I'll create a file or the file actually already exists. I'll put my process ID in the file cgroup.prox that is going to put that process into the slash group one. But it is hierarchical, so I can create further directories within group one, and let's call that slash group one dot one. 
and I have an exactly same structure. So if I want something to go under group 1.1, I will put the process ID in the C group.prox file there. If I want the process ID to actually be in group 1, I'll put it there. In the C group.prox file, if I want it to be part of group 2, I'll put my process ID in the C group.prox file there. If I want them just to go back to the top level accounting group, I can put my PID in the top level C group.prox file. And where I say cgroup.prox file, you can also use the tasks file and put your PID into that file. So this ensures that your PID now is part of that group. What we will discuss next is, okay, so what happens when your PID is part of a group and how does the control work then? Because now that that is defined by each of the controllers here. So the memory controller will do something different. It'll control memory consumption, obviously. The CPU, CPU account controllers will do something different, which is account for CPU consumption and control CPU usage. So that depends on the C group controller we are using. This happens to be the fundamental building block for group process control in scheduling as well. Now, let us go back and a little bit in deeper into how do these fundamentals work under, under the hood. So, the scheduler structure we discussed so far was independent processes or independent tasks. And look at this example where you have two run queues and we have on the left, the real-time run queue within the CPU run queue zero and the CFS run queue similarly on the right side on CPU one. There are tasks two and three that are independent tasks have sketch entities in CFS run queue on CPU zero. Similarly, task four and five are independent tasks that are on CFS run queue on CPU one. Now they are independently controlled. So there is nothing that is managing group control for these tasks. Now to manage group control, there's a new entity that comes in and that is the task group in Linux. And task groups allows you to actually manage processes as groups under some level of control together. So what it does is it also changes how the whole sketch entity structure works. If you want to control things together, then each task has a sketch entity, but they have to now be in another hierarchical structure of sketch entities because sketch entities were actually providing, you know, the ability to run on the CFS run queue. Now we are detailing in this diagram out the CFS run queue and the CFS run queue has sketch entity one where task one is there. Now on sketch entity two, we actually have put two tasks in a hierarchical structure. So what happens is there is a CFS run queue, but Sketch Entity 2 also gets its own CFS run queue. So it gets its own run queue where it has its own sub schedule entities 2.1 and 2.2 and tasks two and three go under that. So in the previous model, tasks two and three would have gone under the main CFS run queue. Now the Sketch Entity 2 run queue is under the CFS run queue and Sketch Entity 2 is doing group management. So it is a group entity now, and it therefore has its own CFS run queues and its children go under that. So that is how fundamentally the hierarchies get structured. And this hierarchy can go down even more where every Sketch Entity that is acting as a group entity will have its own uh, run queue. At the top level run queue will decide between each of these top level groups. So the CFS run queue on the top level will decide between the Sketch Entity 1 run or Sketch Entity 2 run. And if the decision is that Sketch Entity 2 needs to run, then it will defer to the Sketch Entity 2's CFS run queue to decide which task actually should be picked to run. So task groups now connect these tasks together through this structure. Now this is for one CPU, but when we are working on multiple CPUs, you still want control over the grouping of tasks across these CPUs. So now what I have here is depicted where you have two CPUs and let's say you have tasks four and five as well, and they both need to be managed and they're all part of the same task group because we put them all in the same cgroup.prox file and they happen to be now running still on two different processors. So 
to apply the same controls, the task group actually is a structure that is not linked to just one CPU. So the task group will have a sketch entity one on one CPU. It will also have a, a group sketch entity two on the other CPU, which will have their own hierarchies on those. So that's how this whole larger set of hierarchies gets managed. What's the purpose of task group here? The task group actually does the whole syncing of what's the full runtime because we are still looking at how much, say in the case of CPU, V runtime, how much execution runtime uh, have we had. And because we are going to control on that entity, this is the way that it actually will get that numbers together such that the decision making is now going to happen centralized and not just according to each processor's run. So that's the core job of the task group now. And at regular intervals, not, not all the time, but at regular intervals that are defined through a variable, it is going to synchronize that number. And now the tasks that are part of this control group across all processors will be controlled uh, uh, through the central model. So as examples that we will discuss, there are other C group controllers, but because we are discussing scheduling as a topic, we will discuss primarily four kinds and three out of them are main, one is another one. So CPU, CPU account, uh, CPU set, they're all about the CPU and PID. Uh, PID also deals with scheduling because it rejects or accepts new process creation. So I just clubbed it together into these for our topic. CPU controller will help you limit CPU quota. And uh, there is a CPU shares model as well uh, for CPU utilization. CPU account is just an accounting controller and it'll provide you more extensive data for CPU utilization. CPU set is going to help set processes only to run on some CPUs uh, and not on all. So it will have an opinionated view on which CPUs to use. Now we also have a PID and PID will enable limiting the maximum number of child PIDs that you can create uh, at, at a point in time. And it prevents fork bomb situations. And sometimes your code is just wrong and it just it, in a loop could be creating child processes. So it, it helps limit that kind of damage. Uh, CPU controller. Now let's get into the CPU one and we'll talk through a few of these uh, at a theoretical level of what are those uh, settings that you can do. And, and then I will go through a few examples that I have written and sort of show how it actually works. So CPU controller will control the CPU time sharing for process groups. Uh, control, and I've divided this generally into the control part and the accounting part. In the control part, you can set uh, cpu.shares. Now cpu.shares will also be a file and the way you would uh, manage it is by uh, inserting a value in this file. The default is 1024 which is the same as the default load weight we had for the nice values we discussed. So it's consistent to be the same so the default value is like for nice equals zero uh, for load weight. And you can, if you want to change it, you can increase or decrease it in this file. CPU.CFS period and CPU CFS quota. Now these two go together and they help limit the amount of CPU that a process can consume in a defined period. So the period will be defined in this file and, and you can use either the default something like 100 milliseconds and that's the default I saw in my system. And within that 100 millisecond period, you will define through CFS quota uh, microseconds how much you can consume. And the values can be, there's a minimum of one millisecond. Uh, you, could, you could set at minus one, which would mean no quota limit, or you could set at equal to the period, which would mean I get to consume the full CPU for that period, or actually you can go beyond the period to indicate that I want to use more than one CPU because you can have multiple processes. You could make it four times the period to show I am going to consume the quota for four CPUs. On the right side is the accounting number. And that's where the files that we have on CPU stat 
that is their cpu.stat file it shows you a number of periods a number throttled number and throttle time these are directly related to limiting on the quota side if there is a quota limit and you actually become throttled then it'll show you how many periods you ran and you actually did get throttled and throttling means you you were runnable you wanted to run but you were not allowed to because you reached your quota cpu account controller now this is purely accounting there is no control here and the accounting is detailed accounting and there are a few files you can use the cpu account.stat file which gives you user and system usage in clock ticks and clock ticks as in user hertz clock ticks not as the system clock ticks it also has two more files and you can use those actually instead of the .stat file to get usage and then you get usage in nanoseconds uh, cpu account.usage nanoseconds and then you don't have to do any tick interpretation and cpu account.usage per cpu now per cpu gives you information on each of the cpus that you were running so if you add up all the values on the per cpu they should they should be actually the one that you see on the total usage and so so it gives you cpu level distribution of your cpu utilization the cpu set controller now it adds cpu and memory node affinity for process groups now memory node is numa nodes we discussed that and it typically deals with one socket which has multiple cores will be connected and become one uh, memory node and uh, cpu is the cores and if you want to have your task be on a certain number of cores or exclusively on some cores or memory nodes you can define that here so you use the cpu set dot cpus you put the list of the cpus that you can that you want to run your process on cpu set dot mems will define the memory nodes uh, that you want to run on which is the sockets uh, cpu set dot cpu exclusive could say do you really want exclusive placement on that so nobody else can actually run similarly mem exclusive and there are a few other uh, settings here that I didn't go through but you can find out yourself now uh, the root CPU group uh, contains the CPUs and memory nodes available to the kernel because if your question is okay so what can I even set here uh, it's easy just to go to the top level uh, CPU set group and uh, if you just cat those values or read those values of these uh, files you see what is the total number available to you now i will go through and i've written some test examples to see how these work in action now what i have is a four cpu system uh, i have a little code like loop.c program that is like what we ran from before it just loops uh, nothing special just use a cpu while it's looping uh, and this one loops 100 million times and generally in my system it takes about 180 milliseconds of cpu time to complete now I run one of these or more of these in parallel and depending on the test. Uh, and then I have a script, uh, it's a shell script so that I just run the shell script and it does whatever it does. It produces an output. What it generally will do in this structure is it'll create a CG1 directory uh, under the controlled resource. And then it'll set the control values for the control we want to do. And then it uh, places the process PIDs, it creates the loop process, it'll place the process PIDs in this directory so the control starts happening. And then at the end of the run, uh, when all of these loops have completed, one or more, it displays the CPU accounting information so we can see what was happening you know, under the hood uh, when this process was running. So let us go through these scenarios uh, here. Now, one example is uh, example one. So CPU unbounded, if you don't do anything and don't touch the system, how does it behave? So I have scenarios in the script. So I run by default, I'll run four parallel uh, loops. And the, the left side is the code, the shell script. And on the right side, I have the output of the shell script. So what is interesting in this execution is that you know you just see if, if you have unbounded run on my four cores what does it look like and the reason i run four in parallel is because each one can be assigned to each of these cores 
So the default values for CPU.CFS period are, you know, 100 milliseconds and it is specified in microseconds and the CFS quota is minus one, which means there is no quota limit set. On the left side, you can see that my code is actually going to cause all of these to be displayed and then eventually I just do an echo dollar dollar and move it to the CG1 cgroup.prox. What it does is it's going to actually move the parent uh, into that prox file and all the children that are going to come after that will also go to that cgroup prox file. So everything goes under the CG1 controller uh, for me. And, and under slash CG1, I change the file settings later on, not in this run, to see the changes to the execution. Uh, so the execution, I measure the real time data that it takes and real means it is just total time. It's not the CPU time, but total net time. And I can see for each of these four processes here on the right side, I have taken 18.18, uh, which is in seconds. And that means 180 milliseconds. And that's roughly the time I expect the process to take. Below I have the cpu.stat file and I can see that everything, number of periods, number of throttle, throttle time is zero. So there was no throttling and obviously not because there was no quota set. It's all minus one. Then the cpu accounting.account.stat file is where I get detail level CPU accounting. Now user 75, system zero, it means that all my time was spent in user space, not in kernel. And 75 means for me, each one of these is 10 milliseconds. So 75 is 750 milliseconds. Why is it uh, 750? And if uh, how does it connect back to the individual utilization? Well, it is 750 and each one of them took 180 milliseconds. So total CPU time is actually the, the addition of CPU time across all of the course that I was running. So CPU accounting dot uh, uh, usage and the CPU accounting.stat file is giving me the total time. So CPU accounting.usage is also more precise in nanoseconds. So when I get 750 milliseconds in more precise terms, it is 755 milliseconds uh, that I can see from CPU account.usage file on the right. And this number is in nanoseconds and I'm just converting it into milliseconds. So 755 milliseconds total CPU utilization, all of it in user. I can see the distribution now below of this 755 in uh, by per CPU, and I can see that it's roughly equal on all of them, about 189, 88 milliseconds. So it's it's more precision than the top level numbers that we had, and about 189 something, and then they add up total to a CPU utilization of 755 uh, milliseconds. And then I can see that the real time execution was still 180 milliseconds because the work CP was spread into four cores that did the work in parallel and got the execution complete. So this is my perfect case. Everything works great. Everything is parallel and uh, no worries. Now, what if I put a quota limit here? And that is my example too. So in this case, I put a quota limit of uh, 10 milliseconds for every 100 milliseconds. The period is 100 milliseconds and the quota is also 100 milliseconds. So now I set both of these equal and I do have a bound on my quota now. So let us look at the execution time here. And I can see that my execution time is roughly 70 milliseconds for each one of these. What happened here? I had a quota that's exactly equal to the period then why do I seem to have increased my execution time? Now I look at the cpu.stat file to see what happened. Did I get throttled? And yeah, for sure, you had nine, seven periods that you were throttled in. And the total throttling time in nanoseconds is given out there specifically. So that gives me additional information. Okay, so cool, I got throttled and that's why it took each of these processes took longer to execute. Uh, what is my CPU time? Well, on user, it still says 75, which is 750 milliseconds. So the CPU time is the same. What is the CPU accounting dot usage? It is still 759 milliseconds from that number. So it's still the same. So the CPU time is not changing. Only the real time is changing because I am being throttled here. And why are you being throttled? Because I have four processes, but I have given the quota to be exactly the same as one CPU. Period and quota is the same. So I'm really being allowed to run 
25% of the CPU that I have available. And, and that's why roughly the times increased four times in real time. So 70, 700 milliseconds is instead of 180 milliseconds that I saw in my first example. So this is a good second example on how actually can you put a quota limit and just showing you the results of how the process then shows and how long it takes. Let us look at another one now, CPU sharing. CPU shares, which is a load weight based system. This is different than the quota based system. This is if there is other processes, then it'll have a certain amount of load that it will carry these processes. And the setup is a little bit more complicated. And what I've done is I've actually, instead of having one control group, I have created two control groups. And then I put four of my processes on CG1 and four of these processes on CG2. So I create eight together. And the reason is I just wanted to see how the first four on CG1 compared to the second four on CG2 as I am changing the shares on each one of these. So what I do is I have a program and I can pass parameters to actually change the number of programs that I run and then the, the shares that I want to set for CG1 and CG2. So in the first example here, I set the shares at the same default, 1024, 1024. And then I look at execution time data. So real and then CG2 means the process is under CG2 and real CG1 means the process is under CG1. So I have four and four each. So I can see that roughly between 350 to 380 milliseconds, they all completed. And this is roughly a process that still should take uh, 180 milliseconds each, but it is taking longer. Obviously I have four cores and I'm trying to run eight processes, so it'll take double the time. Uh, but the distribution between all these processes is roughly the same. So everybody was getting equal, almost equal time to run. The CPU accounting usage file below shows uh, it still is on each of these control groups about 763, 762 milliseconds. So that's pretty consistent with running four of each because we know that they take about 180 milliseconds each CPU time. And then below that, we can use the per CPU details. And these are useful if they were going a little out of whack, but these are pretty balanced between 190, 189 milliseconds that are used by each of these processes. So, you, you know, so it's, it's all balanced, 124, 1024, everybody getting equal. What if we now change it to everybody does not get equal? And I've tried another couple of examples, one where I increase the shares on CG2 to 2048. And another one where I said, OK, uh, you know, in the first example here, I double and then I say, OK, what if I make it 10 times and give it a, you know, even more? So I can look at my execution time data on the left side, which is where I increase the CPU shares for my control group CG2. And I can see that uh, because I gave it more CPU shares, the programs are running faster. And you can see that CG2s are completing first between 24 and 31. And my CG1s actually completed second between, you know, 37, 38 milliseconds. Uh, now, on the right side is, is an even more extreme view where I said, OK, I'm really going to balance where I'm going to give most of my uh, CPU weight to CG1, no, CG2. And now, if I look at the execution time on the right side, uh, I can see that the CG2 processes were finishing in 19, which is 190 milliseconds to 210 milliseconds, which is pretty fast, which means it was really getting the CPU. And then the CG1 processes come in at 370, 350 milliseconds. So they came in second. And clearly the CPU was being given to CG2 here based on the shares I have provided. You can also see on the bottom that the amount of CPU is the same between CG1 and CG2 when you look at the account.usage files. 743 milliseconds, 751, roughly the same. CPU distribution by cores is the same. So the CPU time is the same that each process needs. The real time that it actually takes is increasing in some cases. So the priority is changing between what the scheduler should run. Example number four is different now. I'm going to go into CPU sets. And what I try to do here is, is pin the load that I have to some 
CPU. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to pin my CPUs to just zero. So all my load and just one core. You won't get four cores anymore. You have to run on CPU zero. And on the right side, you can see the results. So I can see CPU set dot CPUs is zero. CPU set dot mems is zero. And then I get my execution time. And that's about 750 milliseconds of real time that I took. No throttling. You can see the cpu.stat file 000. So no throttling was involved. You can still see that the CPU time is still 757 milliseconds. Whether you know you can you, you can look at it in CPU account.usage file. But then the per CPU distribution is interesting in this case. You can see that all of that 757 milliseconds actually came from the leftmost CPU and the others are showing 0, 0, 0. So this is really what we wanted. So we pinned the workload on CPU 0 and CPU 0 accounted for all of this time. So all these four processes that we ran, they took four times more, but they were all just running on one CPU. And that's what we expect to happen. So these were examples of how actually we can manage CPU usage uh, here. Uh, there's another one that's the PITS controller. Uh, there's only one thing you can do here. You can set the bids.max, maximum pits you can get. Uh, and then it has one accounting file that tells you the number of current pits uh, that you have under this one, this process. So, and there's a kernel configuration that actually uh, says what are the pits, the max pits that are allowed to be actually started by this process. Uh, so, so there is a hard level at the kernel level, but we are really going to use our control file pits.max to control number of forking or PIDs that you can create as a child process. So in this one, uh, what I do is actually, I create a directory for CG1, but this time I'm creating it under the slash PIDs control group. Look at the directory, slash PIDs, slash CG1, not slash CPU, slash CG1. So, and then what I do is I, in this one, I will put a PIDs.max value and the value I put under this directory is five for pits.max. And then I say, okay, so I'm going to start and I changed my default here to five processes uh, instead of four. So pits.max is five and I'm going to start five processes. And then I start executing and uh, after every process I spin up, I just also output on the right side the, the current pits.current value, which is coming from the accounting. And I can see initially I have two before I spin anything and, and two because actually every even like a command here uh, to, to fork uh, or to run a process, every command is a process. And so that's why, you know, you start it and you have two already, you know, and one was the original shell process. The second one is the process that uh, is actually the command that we are running. So you start with two. Uh, you know, and then you you start one more and the pids.current file becomes three and then it becomes four after you start the second one, you start the third one, it becomes five. You start the fourth one and you, you get this fork retry resource temporarily available. That is where the control group is in action now. So you it actually stopped uh, allowing more process forks. But it keeps you on a wait. It doesn't totally stop like blow up, it, it now puts you on a wait and when one is available, you actually get it. And so you you get you get that one and then move forward and then another resource is temporarily unavailable. And then eventually all these become available because the load program completes and then you are allowed one more at that time because your pids.current will decrease. And then you go back to a lower value after that. And eventually, you know, your pits dot current will decrease. Uh, so, so this is nice because it shows you how you can actually control your pits creation through this control group. So that was a lot about scheduling. Uh, we we have already gone through Linux scheduling. We have gone through normal process scheduling. We went through group scheduling. It gets a little complicated by the time you get through this, and it it was same for me too. But eventually, I think these concepts, there are a few concepts that you really have to keep together and it's, it's going to come together. Uh, next uh, lecture will be on sleeping processes. Those are not processes we schedule. So scheduling is 
done. But it's interesting to just know if, if you're not scheduling processes, what, what's happening with those processes? So I just thought, okay, we'll have a small one on sleeping processes too. All right, thank you then.